And now we move, sadly, to none, to the last subject of the semester, radioactive decay. So there's a few key terms I want to bring to your mind as we start. Radioactive decay is referring to the change of unstable nuclei to another. The material that is undergoing the reaction is called the parent nuclide, and the resulting nuclide is called the daughter nuclide. And there are three types of particles that you're probably familiar with, but we just want to restate those here. There's beta particles, beta rays, which are negative charged. We know that because when run through a plate, they bend toward the positive plate. And alpha particles, essentially helium nuclei, are positive charge, and we confirm that because it bends when put through an electric field. It bends toward the negative plate. And gamma rays are charge neutral. They pass straight through. So we know we have some very high energy particles, and some of them have charges. Now let's review the main types of radioactive decay. And so what will happen here is nuclei, in an attempt, as we talked about earlier, to move into this stable region, it will gain or lose subatomic particles. And this diagram here illustrates some of those in cartoon fashion. And here's a description of those. Alpha decay. That's where we're losing the alpha particle, essentially losing a helium nucleus. So what's going to be the result of that? The daughter is going to have a larger neutron to proton ratio than the parent. And this is reasonable. If you have a material and you start shedding positive charges, what's going to be left? More neutral charges. And so your neutral to positive ratio is going to go up. It's going to move you up this graph. Gamma emission, that we talked earlier about gamma being just raw energy. And so here's an example of a, of a, of a reaction that gives off gamma particles. And here we have cobalt in an excited state, that quantum mechanics excited state stuff. So as it goes from excited state to a lower state, it gives off massive amounts of energy. There's no change in weight and there's no change in charge. Beta decay, that's essentially, we said, an electron that lives in the nucleus, yes? And uh, so what's going to happen? Essentially, you have a neutron and it's going to eject what's equivalent to an electron and what you're going to gain there is a positive charge. And in this case, then the daughter is going to have a smaller neutron to proton ratio than the parent. Because, well, you're swapping neutrons out for protons, and that ratio shrinks. Positron, that's one of those strange little things that we haven't dealt with before. And we said by analogy, we're just going to call that an electron with a positive charge. It typically occurs in low neutron to proton parents. Okay, so we're down here, right? And the neutron-proton ratio of the daughter is going to be greater than the neutron-proton of the parent due to the way the charge shifts. And finally, there's electron capture, beta capture, uh, beta particle capture. And one way to think about it is you really just have a proton plus an electron, and that's going to a neutron. Exactly the opposite of what we saw with beta decay. It's kind of interesting that there's two ways to get there. So how can, you, how can you get a neutral particle? Well, let's see. We could lose a beta particle. We, we could gain a positive charge in that way. Or we could gain a positive charge. And so whether you lose a beta particle or you gain a positron, the same net result, that is kinetically driven. And so let's look at a radioactive decay series here. Typically for heavier elements, there's three main degradation paths, all of which tend to terminate in lead 82. 
So what we want to do now is just look at the uranium-238 degradation series. You start out uranium-238 and through a series of alpha particle emissions and beta particle emissions, the atomic weight and the P to Z and the N to Z ratio continuously change. And from 1.59, that's the neutron divided by uh, proton ratio. And it moves in the scale down to 1.51 ratio of neutrons to protons. And it does it through that series of those two types of decay. Now what I've attempted to do, this is not terribly, terribly insightful, but I just wanted you to see this path that we just reviewed. If you put the dot of the starting material, uranium-238, if you superimpose that on this uh, graph that we've been using, this band of stability, and then you put a dot that corresponds to where we end up at the lead uh, 92, you can actually see the path. So this graph, these changes are how uranium pulls itself back into the middle of this band and it goes to a material that is non-radioactive. Well, these reactions occur at some rate and that rate is governed by first order kinetics. Recall for the first order kinetics, the rate was equal to K times the concentration of our reactant. The integrated rate log expression took the form log A equal minus KAT plus log A. In this case, we're not interested in the zero order kinetic equation. We're not interested in the second order. We are governed by first order kinetics. In terms of nuclear decompositions, we're going to look at things equivalent to Geiger counter clicks to get a handle on the concentration. Much as we did in the lab, when instead of knowing the concentration, we used Beer's Law, we used the transmittance of a solution as a proxy for concentration. Here we're going to do the same thing. So notice that this equation, rewritten, has all of the same components. It's a y equal mx plus b, where the key feature here that you need to recognize is that lambda takes the place of your slope of minus ka. But we still have a time component, and we still have a concentration component. And because the equation is essentially, a, is essentially just a restatement of what you already know, it can be rearranged in a similar fashion. And so were I to take a test with a cheat sheet, rather than have to work through a bunch of this algebra during the test, I might be tempted to go ahead and put variations of the main first order connects equation so that I didn't have to spend test time doing it. Another key thing to note here is the half-life. We know half-life's important. There are tables of half-life. So a lot of times it's fairly easy to get or to look up the half-life data. So it may be handy to also have an equation for the half-life. Now you can derive it, but you might just remember that. What? When half of a material has decomposed, this number is going to be one half of that one. In other words, this ratio is going to be two. So your slope times t is going to be equal to log of two at your half-life. Well, this is just a number. So you can also rearrange this. And what do you get? The half-life is equal to 0 0.693 times lambda. With this little kit of equations, you can work almost any kinetics problem relating to radioactive decay. Let's look graphically at how that looks. And shown here is a graph for cobalt-60. And it has a half-life of 5.26 years. So what this means is if we start out with 10 grams 
at time zero. If we move one half life, or 5.72 years, we're only going to have half as much material left. And if we go for another half life, if we go for another five years, we're going to have half of that. And so we keep cutting this down by half. And a lot of people will say, well, we're going to assume something's essentially extinguished after five half-lives or after ten half-lives. That's up to whoever's doing the calculations. But normally about five or six half-lives. So what does this mean here? So you could actually do the calculation and say, well, after about 12.5% uh, about of this remains after 5.81 years. So let's look at an example of a question using half-life. Radon-222 has a half-life of 3.823 days. How long will it take? Oh boy, I'm going to go ahead and do that. How long? Anytime I see the question I'm looking for, I just go ahead and box it. How long will it take? 0 0.750 grams of radon-222 to decay to the point that we only have 0.1 gram remaining. So let's see what I know. I know the half-life. Okay, so let me just kind of mark what I do know here. I know the half-life of this. Okay, that's convenient. Will it take 7.75 grams? So I know a starting material. I know a starting amount to decay to the point that only 0.1 gram remains. Hmm. And I have what? I have a final concentration. If you just do that, pull out your candidate equations and just take a few moments to analyze the question and just see what it is you know and you look at what's left, it gets pretty easy at that point. So let's just look at these candidate equations here, right? So what are we looking for? Let me put in, in, in red what I'm looking for. We're looking for what? Time. We're looking for that. Can anybody see a way to work this problem? Probably so. It should be pretty straightforward at this point. What do I have here? One equation, one unknown. Guess what I can calculate if I need it? So lambda, do I know lambda? I do. I put the little check plus. I, I, I can calculate it. So what do we have here with this equation? There's my unknown. I have one equation and one, two, three, four unknowns. I know two of them, but I can calculate that. At this point, I have one equation and one unknown. Or maybe I want to use it in this version. T is my unknown, so I have to know everything else. One equation, one unknown. I know this, I know this, and I can calculate this. So actually, once you lay the equations out and do the analysis, this is a very simple question. First thing we're going to do is calculate lambda. What is lambda? 0 0.181 days. At that point, it's just a matter of plugging in what you know, solving the algebra, and coming up with 11.1 days. So, if you have 0.75 grams of radium, you come back 11 days later, you only have 0.1 gram remaining. Let's look at another one. Samples of seeds and plant matter from King Tutankhamun's tomb have a carbon-14 radioactive decay of 9.07 disintegrations per minute per gram. So, every gram has 9.07 disintegrations occurring every minute. How long ago did King Tut's reign come to an end? As of 2017. Okay, so let's take a look and see what we know. I'm going to go back and follow on our, our, our common equation here. I'm going to pick an equation that has what? My concentrations, some unit of time, and some slope. My first order, the four unknowns typically in a first order reaction equation. And that's the good thing. It's so radioactive decay. I know I can cut straight to the chase. It's first order. So what do we know here? We know we have 9.07 disintegrations per minute per gram 
of the material from the tomb. But it's been labored on for some time. We don't know how much. But if we had a fresh sample, we know from standard information, and you can assume I would have given you in this pro given this to you in the problem, that you would have had 13.6 disintegrations per minute per gram. In other words, this is what happens with fresh, if you will, carbon-14. We also know from published data that the T1 half for carbon-14 radioactive decay is 5,730 years. And with that, we have all the information we need to come up with an answer. Assuming you remember it's first-order kinetics, and you're going to use a first-order kinetic equation, it has the four things you need. Initial concentration, final concentration, an indicator of time, and an indicator of rate. So at this point, all you need to do is the algebra. Rearrange your equation, solving for t. You know the values for n original and n at the current time. You can also calculate lambda from your t one-half equation. And from that, you plug the numbers in and you come up with 3,350 years. So, when did his reign end? Okay, well, from 2017, if we take off 3,350 years, we get uh, 1,333 BC. Almost. Well, we got to add two years back. <laughs> Why? because there's no year zero. Yeah. So the, the clock didn't go from year minus one to zero to, to year one, okay? We lose these two. It went straight from what? The year one minus one BC to the year one BC. I think that's kind of funny because <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so there we go. So we got to give we got to give two years back for that for that little observation, and so we wind up with uh, what year? Um, uh, 1335 BC. So approximately to three sig figs. About about 1340 BC is when King Tut must have been must have been doing his thing. All right, let's continue on. Let's let's look at a, a couple of fission reactions. And this is where, what, larger unstable atoms are breaking down to smaller, more stable atoms. And so sometimes they do this in violent fashion. So why it's got so much energy is not only is it nuclear, but it gets compounded by the fact that it's a chain reaction. Which means if we can get this started, one will hit two and or maybe make three subatomic particles. And these are high energy particles, right? And they're going to shoot over to another one and they're going to bust those up into three, two or three pieces. And next thing you know, it's going to be what you might call a runaway reaction. Now, you don't want a nuclear reaction to be a runaway reaction. But what they are, whether they're runaway or not, are chain reactions. Now, is, is something fissionable? Yeah, okay. So that's materials that can sustain a nuclear fission reaction. So sometimes these things started and they're just not sustainable. They're just not fissionable materials. Okay, so they're not going to be, they're not going to be good to run a nuclear plant or say to make a bomb with it. Okay, critical mass. Even if you have fissionable material, you need a certain critical mass for this to happen. In other words, you, you kind of get it started, and, and you don't want it to fizzle out. You've got to have a certain amount of material to really make this thing pop. Okay, so that minimum amount of material you need is called critical mass. Subcritical mass, that means you don't have enough material. It's not going to happen. It is going to fizzle out. And finally, supercritical. Uh, if, you're, if you're making a bomb or you're running a nuclear plant, you want supercritical mass. You want it where you can start the reaction, and it is sustainable. Well, I mentioned bombs twice on there, and the reason is because we want to use those as an example. And it's kind of fascinating. The Manhattan Project, uh, to end World War II, the Manhattan Project produced two different versions of atomic bombs. And so the story goes there were two different camps of physicists, and they were absolutely certain that theirs was the best and possibly the only way to make a nuclear bomb work. And so one camp 
came up with this idea of a conventional explosive setting off the reaction. These reactions are kind of hard to get started. It takes a lot of energy to get them started. And then, of course, if it's fissionable and you have critical mass, it's going to take over and it's going to happen. It's going to go just fine, thank you. But you got to get it started. So one group was using conventional explosive. We're just going to hit the nuclear material with a really high energy external source, and that's going to kick this reaction off, and then, and then, and then it's going to happen. We're going to have our nuclear bomb, our nuclear reaction. Meanwhile, there was another camp, and they decided to use an implosion rather than an explosion to detonate their device. That's how those two worked. Just a little factoid now comparing a fission nuclear reaction to one of a traditional combustion. So let's go out and explode one kilogram of uranium-235 and let's compare it to the energy we get from burning one kilogram of carbon, one kilogram of coal. And the energy winds up being a ratio of 2.5 million to one. And so you can see why nuclear reactors and nuclear plants are kind of keen on doing nuclear reactions because you get so much more energy from those as opposed to burning fossil fuels, so-called fossil fuels. And, but were these real? I mean, did they really, did they really look like that? Is that what they looked like? Answers, yeah, that is what they looked like. So these are National Archive pictures of Fat Man and Little Boy. And this is Little Boy as they're actually loading it into the Enola Gay. So it's kind of stark and very somber to see these real pictures. It puts some gravity to it. So these are the actual, actual bombs that blew up. And the good news is it really helped bring World War II to a close. But the really sad point is just the just the utter destruction that these caused. But there they are in all their glory. There's the diagram and there's the real things. But fortunately, we're able to use nuclear power in much more happier civilian terms. And so we have fission reactors and this is a little cartoon of what a nuclear power plant might look like where essentially what you're doing here, not essentially what you're doing is, well, how do we actually use that nuclear energy? How are you capturing it? Because they're not sending nuclear radiation into your home. So how are we converting that? Essentially what you're doing is you're using all of this energy and you're making steam, you're boiling water. You're taking all this reaction and you're boiling water and you're making really hot water. You're making steam and you're making a lot of steam, a really hot steam. And what you're doing is you're basically making, you, you've got steam turbines and you're making generators. You've got steam generators and you're generating electricity from the steam you generate from the nuclear reactions. So that's how that works. So again, you got some fissionable isotope. Uh, you have things called moderators. You've got, uh, you're kicking these things off with neutrons. So neutrons is kind of sort of the flow. That's what we're going to want to control to make reactions faster or slower. And so uh, some of the moderators are like graphite, just right, good old carbon or heavy water uh, called deuterium. Uh, normal water uses hydrogen. Hydrogen has what, one proton? And, and 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 no neutrons well guess what deuterium has yeah it's got one proton and one neutron so it actually has an atomic weight of two as opposed to one and i'll show you in a minute there's also one called tritium which has it's water with uh, called heavy water yes deuterium and tritium heavy water and tritium has uh one proton and two neutrons for a total of three atomic AMU. So this deuterated or heavy water is used and found around some of your civilian uh, reaction systems. Uh, coolant, all right, so you're gonna carry heat to the boiler, but you don't want it to get too hot. So you might use water, uh, you know, you can use molten salt. Yes, you get salt, we talked about that before. You get uh, table salt hot enough, 
It's a liquid and you can look at the heat capacities and you can use those as a coolant as well. The control rods, the all important control rods, yes. So you're gonna, again, wanna adjust the flow of these neutrons. Or how do you do that? Well, one way is to use another, use another metal that, that affects the flow of neutrons. And one example I've shown here, the equation is boron. So you can put boron, it'll capture some of the neutrons, slow it down, pull some of them out of the reaction sequence, and you're gonna wind up with lithium and helium. And so that's kind of the, these control rods are, are kind of the gas pedal to this whole thing. Well, nuclear fusion, let's talk about fusion. That's where we're pulling, what, smaller molecules and we're making heavier molecules. And a good example here is taking four atoms of hydrogen and you're combining them and you're making one atom of helium. And you're getting off subatomic particles and energy. Now, if you look, you'll see the four hydrogens have less mass than the atom of helium. And so what happened? Well, you converted this mass into energy. And we know from Einstein's equation, and that being the speed of light squared, this little bit of mass is going to amount to an enormous amount of energy given off. And this equation, let's drill down on this because it's the all-important. That's what's happening in the sun. Thermofusion. What does that mean? It's just you can kick some of these off. If you've got enough temperature, you can kick them off with high temperatures. Now, what we see here is a mechanism, a three-step mechanism for our reaction. If we look on the previous page, we will see the overall reaction for that mechanism. So going back to our, our, our kinetics, Right, so this reaction actually involves three steps. Hydrogen is going to, what, deuterium, there's your heavy water, a hydrogen with a mass of two, gives off a beta particle. And now you have deuterium, heavy hydrogen in this case, and hydrogen are going to react to give you helium and gamma, raw energy. So you're getting enormous amounts of energy here. And then two of these helium atoms, which are short a neutron, by the way, they combine to give you, if you will, a stable or normal helium atom and two hydrogens back. These fusion reactions give an enormous amount of energy, as you well know if you go to Galveston or you stay out in the sun for any time. So a few facts about that. It's kind of interesting. Fusion reactions at the center of the sun where the temperature is 10, that should be to the seventh power Kelvin. <laughs> okay, okay. So you start getting about a million degrees Kelvin, that's high enough temperature to kick them off. That'll work, that'll work. So they give hydrogen helium isotopes. Now these hydrogen helium isotopes have enough kinetic energy to overcome the long range repulsion Coulomb forces and come within the short range attractive strong nuclear force. So what is this actually making a statement about? The Coulomb forces, all of the positive charges being at the center of the nucleus, they want to blast apart because of those repulsive forces. On the other hand, there's short range attractive forces, the bonding energy that's trying to hold it together. It's that push-pull battle that's going on at the nucleus. The sun produces about four times 10 to the 26 joules per second of electromagnetic radiation. Hmm. Now what's interesting is as much energy as winds up here on the earth, we're only getting a small fraction of that, right? Because the sun is a sphere. I don't know if you thought about this, but the sun's a sphere, yeah? And we're just a little dot out here. And guess what? It's not just beaming all this radiation at us. We're just getting a very, very small fraction. So as hot as it gets here on planet Earth, <laughs> it's doing that with just a minuscule portion of the energy that the sun actually gives off. Right. The source of this energy is this chemical reaction. It's this series of reactions in which four protons ultimately winds up converting into a helium nucleus, plus this energy. This energy adds up to about 2.67 mega 
electron volts of energy. And we know that one mega electron volts is equivalent to about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So I have a question for you. Given this data, could you calculate how many reactions there are per second occurring on the sun? It's all right there. You should be able to calculate that. Your answer goes there. Okay, I'll give it to you. But I couldn't resist. I just wanted you to see good old dimensional analysis will help you out. And it's going to be very simple when I tell you. You want to know how many reactions per second. What do you need? Something with seconds in the denominator and reactions in the numerator. Look back through those three bullet points that I gave you here. And you'll see the information you need to make conversion factors out of those. So, what are we going to do? I'm going to start out with this number that it gave, 4 times 10 to the 6 joules per second, because I need seconds in the bottom. I don't have joules in the top. I have to somehow convert joules to reactions, right? But I can convert joules to mega electron volts. And it told me how many mega electron volts there are per reaction. And so now what do I have? I got my term reaction up here. Everything else look good? Yep, that crosses off because I don't need it in my answer and those cross off, I don't need it in my answer and there you have it. Zero, 0 0.94 times 10 to the 38 reactions. Okay. <laughs> The website I got this from. They put it in what's called engineering notation instead of exponential notation. So actually, I'm going to have to retype this to 9.4 times 10 to the times times 10 to the 37th. Okay, but anyway, so that's that's the correct number there. Is that a big number? That's a really big number. There's that many reactions. This equation is happening this many times on the sun every second of every day of every year of every millennium since it all started. Which brings another sombering thought. This material, hydrogen, is getting consumed. It's getting consumed. Every second this happens, there's a little less of the sun that can react. Entropy is taking its toll. It's making energy less usable. It's making something very stable that's not going to react anymore. Very stable. And it's slowly but surely winding down. So after barring any supernatural intervention, this all won't go on for time eternity. Eventually the sun is going to burn out. Entropy is going to win, and it's going to be a cold, dark universe. But the really good news is, it's going to take a long, long time, and you're going to have more than enough time to take your chemistry final exam. So you can rest easy. I know you were worried about that. And with that, we come to the very end of the last lecture of the semester. It's been great having you for the semester, but this is the end.